course, uh, we're going to be looking at chess through the prism of time, space, and harmony, because between those three factors, I feel like we can pretty much explain everything that's happening on the chess board. Um, we're going to be starting off with the theme of time. While we learned that um, in the beginning of the game, um, we should be going for quick development. So already, you know, what a relevant theme time is comes into play. And of course, you know, even though it's quite an obvious thing, even strong players uh, break rules regarding this theme. And we're going to see some examples of when uh, the rule of, uh, regarding time is broken and how to exploit uh, a lead in time. We're also going to be talking about space, a really, really um, important topic in chess um, that is probably not as well as understood as it should be. Um, and especially all the strategies related to playing with space and against space. Um, so we're going to be discussing those strategies. And finally, we're going to be talking about maybe the most difficult but most important uh, theme, which is harmony. Uh, well, harmony is really the interplay of all of your pieces. It's what we're uh, striving to achieve in our game. 100% uh, harmony, where every piece is in its right uh, position at the right time. And um, we're going to be looking at examples of, you know, when, when it's achieved, how it's achieved, and what happens when, when you're not able to achieve that, you know, uh, the, the kind of defeats that can befall us when, when we don't uh, set up harmony. Hi guys, in this video series, I'm going to be explaining my view of chess. Um, a lot of which I got from my teacher, uh, looking at chess through the prism of time, space, and harmony. Um, if you ask, you know, what is chess? It's not such an easy uh, question, question to answer to break chess down into its constituent elements. I mean, if you say chess is king safety or pawn structure or open files, you know, all things that we know are important, of course, those things um, seem pretty inadequate to explain the game of chess in its entirety. Um, but when you say that chess is time, space, and harmony, um, and you understand what that means, those, uh, those three things pretty much do explain the game of chess. So what are we talking about when we say time? Well, of course, we understand that uh, chess is a time-based game in the sense that you get one turn per move before having to wait uh, for your opponent's response and in that one move you're trying to do the maximum possible so you're looking for the most efficient moves um, trying to accomplish the most in the limited one turn that you have when we're talking about space um, well chess is a space-based game because you're limited to 64 squares um, a lot of strategy involves conquering um, important squares conquering territory um, trying to control certain parts of the board. And um, space is often um, captured by pawns, but it can also be captured by pieces. You know, for example, having a knight very, on a very good outpost um, that controls a lot of squares is, is a form of space. And um, even winning your opponent's material, right? Of course, we know winning your opponent's piece is one of the simplest things that we try to do in chess through tactics. Well, winning material is also space because the more pieces that you wind up having, the more of the board that you control. Um, and harmony, what are we talking about that? Well, basically the rest of chess, right? It's um, harmony really refers to the pieces. So things like the position of the king, king safety, um, where the pieces are located, how they're working with one another, um, and even how well you're preventing your opponent's pieces from working with one another all fall into this, um, into this category. So that's the way I see chess, that most of what goes on on the chess board um, can be understood through that lens, time, space, and harmony. And of course, the most important of those concepts is the concept of harmony. Right, and um, in fact, maybe at the end, um, I can show you some positions where it's possible to be losing on time, losing on space, and still winning. I mean, losing on time means that it's not your turn to move. Losing on space means, let's say you're down a lot of material. So those seem like really um, insurmountable obstacles, right, to having a good position. But chess shows time and again that 
those two, no matter how important they are, actually are superseded by harmony. What, where exactly are the pieces and what they're doing? That's the most important concept. That's something that um, also a feeling for that develops with time. So um, first, though, we're going to start with a more clear concept, concept of time in chess. And um, I'm going to start with, by showing you a game of, a, of a, a couple of students of mine, actually in the Alakine defense, e4, knight of six. So let's get into it where I realized that um, even starting from the opening stages, um, people at the, at the club level are not quite understanding this idea of time and how it should be used, even from the opening. So we have e5, knight d5, d4, d6, c4, knight b6, knight f3, bishop g4. So these opening moves... Um, not something to focus on too much. I mean, if we're going to mention the best move for white in this position, it would be good to clarify things in the center. Mm, trading off a part of your space advantage, by the way, right? Because when we make this trade, we're trading off this pawn for one of these two, depending on how black captures. But we actually still are staying with a space advantage, right? Because we have those two pawns left. Let's say black takes like that. White develops. Black develops, and white um, plays here. In this position, it's actually um, not possible for black to capture the f3 pawn, uh, sorry, the c4 pawn, because of queen e2 check, and a strong move knight d5. And there is a fork on c7 at the end where white's going to be up material. So it would have been better for white to clarify things in the center and still remain with a space advantage. That's kind of the, the point of this variation. In the game, white played bishop e2. Black should have captured on e5. Um, white can't comfortably capture with the e-pawn. They'll have to capture with the knight. There's going to be a trade of pieces. Their d-pawn might hang. Um, but black instead played e6. Knight c3, knight c6, and castles. All right. So this is our key moment. And in this position, now that the knight is on c6, black realize that they have the opportunity to win a pawn by capturing on f3. Earlier, that capture wouldn't have been very good because their b7 pawn would hang. So here they went for this move. Bishop takes f3. Of course, the g-pawn cannot capture because white center is going to fall apart immediately and their king will be extremely weak. The bishop takes and black went for the greedy move. Knight takes c4. So this is the position of interest to us. Um, it's white to move and you can pause, your, um, pause the video here and try to come up with a plan of action for white. I've given this position to, to many students of mine, and especially without some kind of prior introduction, and even sometimes with an introduction to you know, what we're trying to do in this position, um, I've seen moves like that. <clears throat> I've seen moves like, like that very popular moves. I've even seen moves like, like that. Um, well, <clears throat> all of those moves are quite logical. And in general, um, you do want to start off your thinking process by looking for forcing moves such as captures, uh, ch for checks, first of all, captures and threats. So I can definitely understand why the moves bishop takes c6 um, would be appealing to the white player here because people generally can calculate that this move followed by this attacking move is going to win white back a pawn and they're quite pleased with this result um black has to retreat to b6 white wins back the pawn and black has to play queen d7 by the way i've had students in this position even try this move 
a much, much inferior move compared to queen d7 um, for the reason that, you know, if you're just comparing these pieces, you can see that the queen on c6 is infinitely more powerful than the queen on d8. So why step into a voluntary pin and leave your queen so passive? Of course, uh, allowing the move knight b5, also winning material, rather than trying to challenge your opponent's best pieces. It's a good strategy when you see a strong piece in your opponent's camp that you actually actively try to fight against it, not just uh, let that problem um, stay there. So queen d7, now white is faced with a choice. Um, kind of an unappealing choice, actually, because they can either trade queens or they'll have to waste time by retreating. Uh, what would you guys do here? Well, if you realized that the end game doesn't offer you very much and is a very comfortable end game for black, then you're correct and uh, in choosing the queen retreat. Because yeah, um, here the king on d7 feels very comfortable. In the end game, the king um, generally feels good in the center. And even though the position might still be okay for um, for white, I would be a little bit worried here. Um, the pawns are on dark squares. White's got a dark squared bishop. Um, black's king is better than white's king for this coming end game. Black can play the move d5 and c5 like that. That's one possible transformation in the pawn structure. So I would definitely avoid this kind of end game for white and Given that white still has a lead in development, it's very logical to keep the queens on the board for attacking purposes. What can we say about this position? Well, white maintains some initiative. Um, because let's say black tries to develop with a move like bishop e7, we can actually continue making these little threats that are not so convenient for black to defend against. You know, for example, black cannot castle now because bishop h6, there's not going to be any defense to that. Um, and if black plays the move g6, then white's going to stop them from castling. And again, you know, little inconveniences like that, but definitely keeping the initiative on white's side. Um, but is that the most white can do from the starting position? That's the question. If you do that, if you go for this approach, bishop c6 and queen a4, yes, you win the pawn. Yes, you maintain some initiative. Um, but is that really the maximum that you can get from this position? And I think, um, you know, with experience, you understand that Black's play was simply incorrect. You know, and when your opponent just breaks the rules of chess and they sacrifice something very important, time and development, right, um, for the sake of just winning one pawn, that kind of incorrect strategy should meet with a response that is more ambitious than the move bishop takes c6. You know, winning back the material you sacrificed um, when your opponent um, gives up a bishop for a knight, puts your bishop on a great diagonal, then spends more time moving the same piece in the opening. He's already moved that knight one, two three, four times, okay, that's the journey this knight has taken, you know, that something about that is incorrect. So how should we meet that? Um, by the way, the move queen a4, we should just mention it, it's similar to bishop c6, but even worse, because it allows the move d5. Simply protecting the knight on c4 and blocking the bishop, blocking the center, is also the big problem. And um, this is definitely not what white is going for. Does white have compensation here for the pawn? They certainly do. I mean, they still have a space advantage based on those e5 and d4 pawns. They've got the bishop pair. Um, but it's, again, not really the most that white can get, not even close. So what is the correct strategy here for white? Well, Black has lost time, and that time should have been spent on what? Well, in the opening, time should be spent on development and getting the king out of the center. And that's the thing to notice here. Black is two whole moves away from castling, right? So not even close to getting his king out of the center. 
does white have a chance to open up the center in this position? And they do. And that's why your attention really should be directed towards looking at moves like that. Even if they look a little unappealing or complicated at first because, okay, there is another pawn on e5 that's hanging. There's certainly some things you've got to calculate here. But at least your calculation should be going in this direction. Now black has two moves. He can either take the pawn on d5 or the pawn on e5. Well, if they take on e5, you're going to continue opening up lines. Now they have a choice. They can try to trade off your strong bishop with a check. Queen takes and capture. Well, given a little more time, black would have a great position here if he could only play the moves queen d7 and castles long, for example, right? Getting the king to safety and um, would be pretty good. But unfortunately, it's first of all not Black's turn to move. And secondly, um, he's got a loose knight on c4. That's highlighted here. And White can take advantage of that with some nice geometry. Queen h5. King cannot go to e7 because of bishop g5. And both on g6 or king d7 is the same move, queen b5, winning a piece, taking advantage of this unprotected knight. So black doesn't have the chance to take the bishop. And if they take the pawn on e6, white can take this pawn, attacking the rook, moving the bishop away. Um, what is white down here? Just one pawn, but black is... No closer to castling than he was a few moves ago. White's threatening to win a piece with the move bishop takes c4 and queen a4 check. He's threatening f4, winning a piece. Um, you can see completely open position where all of white's pieces are just ready to start attacking the king and black's loose pieces. So obviously a desirable outcome. And on the move, pawn takes d5. Strong move here although three captures are possible, is bishop takes. And the reason is that you are clearing the way for the f pawn to come into the game. So for example, if they take your pawn, this very strong move is important. Remember, we already said a little bit earlier that when you see strong pieces in your opponent's camp, you want to try to challenge them. And uh, the knight on e5 is... Certainly a strong piece if you allow it to stay there. It's blocking the e-file. Um, seems to have a lot of protection there, but you can just get rid of it. And when you do that, more attacking moves. Of course, um, that's uh, what you should be looking for here to develop your initiative are moves that make threats. b7 and f7. If black protects one, you know, they lose a very important pawn, have to run into the center. And um, again, you know, white is still down a pawn, but they're, um, they're making good progress in their attempts to get to the black king. So we can pretty much end on this example. Um, the lesson really to take away here is to kind of um, be able to recognize when your opponent does something to break the logic of chess, right? So when you see your opponent take this approach where they are favoring material over all other um, considerations, and we know material is not the most important factor in chess, right? So when they are taking a piece that's moved once, they're moving it again to trade itself, so that's two moves, for a knight that's only um, played one move, in the uh, course of that, they're putting your piece on a great position, long diagonal for the bishop, and then they're spending more time to capture a pawn. That has to be recognized as just um, unjustified greediness from black. And that kind of approach usually is met with punishments um, based on Okay, things like time, trying to quickly do something because obviously the um, black can fix their position given just a couple of moves. So you got to act quickly. As you act quickly, you've also got to be um, thinking how not to let your opponent 
set up the harmony that he already destroyed, right? So for example, um, we're looking for attacking moves. And that's why, you know, when we're thinking about this move, this looks like an attacking move, and it's certainly a reasonable candidate move, right? But we have to make sure that we're not giving our opponents a chance to um, extricate himself from these difficulties. So when you see this move happen, d5, and you realize, okay, all your plans have come to nothing, the, bishop, the position is closed, the queen's no longer attacking anything, neither is the bishop, you see it's the wrong way. And usually the way to punish this is, of course, not to go for small material gains back. It's not to focus on just getting the pawn back that you lost, but it's really to see what is the problem here. The main problem is black's king in the center, two moves away from castling. Um, how to take advantage of that is opening up the center, and that's what we should be trying to calculate. This move d5, um, even if it seems to be an investment of more material. Okay, now I think we've understood that. And we are going to see a similar example from another student of mine. Kind of a funny story to this game. So again, it starts as an Alhein defense. c4, knight b6. And in this game, white correctly took here. Early on, clarifying things in the center so they don't have to keep worrying about black playing the move d takes e5. c takes d6, knight f3, bishop g4, knight c3, knight c6, bishop e2, and guess what black decided to do here? Well, black decided to take the knight on f3 because they saw that, again, they have a chance to win a pawn. When I saw my, my student do this, I was, I was just shocked. And um, the reason I was shocked is that the game that we just saw in the first example was something I'd already shown the student. So he knew exactly why the move bishop takes f3 and knight c4 was wrong in the previous example. And yet he has this position. Now you see it's a little bit different, you know. And when he says to me, yes, I know, I remember the previous game, but this is different because white does not have the move d5 opening the center. And I just thought that was... That was really funny because, you know, he's right. There is a little detail. If you guys realize that um, in the previous example, black's pawn was on e6. We hadn't yet traded the e and c pawns, and white was playing d5 here. But here, the move d5 is not leading to an opening of the center. So he thought that because of that little difference, that it was acceptable to play this move. It made it all better. But... Um, you know, of course, to a more experienced eye, it still looks pretty dubious because still the same thing is going on, right? Is that you're taking, you're wasting time with that trade and then you're wasting time with this capture. And what is the right way for white to play? Well, of course, there's the move bishop c6 and queen a4, by the way. Um, that is, again, something that hopefully at this point is not going to be tempting anybody giving up that beautiful bishop in order to just win back the pawn like that. Very unambitious strategy, maybe even more so than in the previous example, because on in this position, when you do this, black is already poised to play this move. A nice positional move. Um, black has a dark squared bishop, so he wants to put his pawns in light squares. And playing e6, nice pawn structure for black. He just, you know, the center is closed. So um, not much white can do to take advantage of his lead in development for now. That's why black is able to afford having the king on e8. So you definitely don't want to go and try to trade off that bishop for the knight. This move, however, is uh, pretty tempting. So if you were thinking about this move, it has its points. Um, it wins time, it wins space. The pawn on the fifth rank is pretty strong. Um, it doesn't allow black on easy developments because, um, you know, ideally, of course, in this position, black could be able to play e6 and d5. Of course, that's not really going to happen because every time you try to do that, white's going to play d5, open the center. But this move makes it impossible for that e pawn to move. So black's going to have to spend more time um, developing their bishop to g7. 
So something like this could happen. Right now you're threatening to win the knight with bishop c4 and queen a4. Black has two moves. He can either retreat the knight to b6 or he can play rook c8. Rook c8, you know, white can actually kind of uh, be materialistic there and win the a7 pawn in some lines. Um, on this move, white's got a couple of moves. Queen d4 is an interesting prophylactic move. There's no more move g6 because of f4 and you're going to take advantage of that pin so you're kind of stopping black's harmonious development making black make moves like rook g8 if he wants to move his g pawn so queen d4 would be a good move another interesting move is the move a4 whenever you see a knight on b6 um you can try to harass it with the a pawn it's often an effective uh little move g6 a5 now the knight cannot go back to d7, you see, where he would like to be, because this knight in the middle of the board is trapped. So he's got to go to pretty passive square. You can see white has huge compensation here. Um, bring out the queen, starts threatening the b7 pawn. Not easy to protect at all. And force the rook here. Now you can give a check. The queen cannot block because of bishop b5. And now an unpleasant attack on the rook and h8. Again, not allowing the harmonious development. No bishop g7. Um, and now if you just develop, by the time black gets to play bishop g7, well, they can't castle, right? So, um, by the way, a7 pawn is kind of a target here. The knight from c8 can't move. So white has just, I don't know, Huge, huge compensation. Well, when I say compensation, we're already meaning big advantage for white for the pawn that he's lost because it's not clear how black is going to, um, what he's going to do with his king or his knights. So if you would play the move d5, um, you'd be very justified in doing that. Of course, key, I mean, next key move is bishop e2. That is a key. You don't want to just allow the trade of pieces. One of your points here with taking space since d5 is a space taking move is that um you don't want to trade pieces because then black will um, be able to comfortably more comfortably maneuver in the space that he has so bishop e2 is an important move and also making threats not giving black time for g6 because his knight is under threat so he's got to spend more time you know defending it that's why d5 is one very logical strategy. But when I was trying to, you know, explain to my student how white should play, of course, you know, I had to think a little bit about this position. And then I was like, aha, uh -huh. well, what if we, you know, there's another idea, not taking space, of course, but just developing our pieces. I mean, white cannot prove anything to black. Um, he can't prove anything about a lead in development or time unless he actually completes development himself. So he needs to start um, that with a move castles. Now, what should black do? Well, every time black plays this move, white plays the move d5. And that opening of the center is going to be pretty deadly for black. So he can't do that. So what is logical as a way to develop for black? Of course, the move g6. All right, well, it looks like black just needs a couple of moves to play bishop g7, castles, and have a perfectly good position. But remember, um, sometimes you just don't have the time to do the things that you want to in chess. White plays rookie one. So again, simple strategy, bringing pieces into the game. If you want to show that your development is better, well, or that you have an easier time of it, then that's what you've got to put your pieces on good squares. So rook e1, bishop g7, black is one move away from castling, but it's not going to happen. Bishop g5, every single move, developing move by white, and not allowing black to do what he wants to do because he cannot castle now because of the e7 pawn being lost and the loss of material. So, so far, everything is flowing very smoothly. As you can see, white puts their pieces on right squares, they're developing their pieces, and they're making threats, and they're making it difficult 
for Black to accomplish what he needs for his position, um, which we always say we, that they, those things have to go hand in hand, that when you're developing your initiative, it's, um, it has to be accompanied by not letting your opponent neutralize it by accomplishing his aims. So that's why the move bishop g5 is very important, and it provokes the move f6. Not a move black wants to make, it's really a move that black has to make to protect the e7 square. And now we have to retreat. But let's see the effect that we have cre created um, by the move bishop g5, the weakening of this diagonal. Now the move that black wants to make with castles is simply not possible because of bishop d5 winning the knight. So, you know, bishop d5 is a move that you can say breaks harmony in black's position. It induces a move that black really, really doesn't want to play, weakening their light squares and blocking their bishop at the same time. So, f6, bishop f4, and knight b6. Well, if you don't want to lose that knight, you should move it to a safe square. Now what? Well, black is resuming his plans to castle. It's going to happen next move. Now, if you're thinking queen b3, it's a good idea. Fortunately, it doesn't work because um, there's that central pawn hanging and suddenly you lose not just a pawn, but the important light squared bishop and pretty much everything. So unfortunately, that doesn't work. So what to do? How to stop your opponent's um, plan of castling? Well, remember what I said about knights being on the b6 or b3, g3, g6 squares. They're very vulnerable to an attack from the side like that. Turns out that this knight on b6 is a um, very key piece for black. And this move a4 stops them from castling because once you get rid of this knight, all of black's light squares fall. He has to go here, and now this check is really strong. And now you take this pawn, and the bishop on f3 springs to life. And unfortunately for black, the tactics just do not favor him, because if he takes this pawn, white takes here, and not only wins the exchange, but in the end wins this extremely important pawn, getting a rook to the seventh rank. And this is winning for white. So what can black do after the move a4? Well, let's say he plays a5 himself. Now, what's been the effect of that move? It's kind of weakened this knight, right? It's removed one of his defenders. So when you go knight d5 here, pretty powerful move leaping into the center. Of course, if black takes it, then they can forget about ever castling, and you can see um, how their light squares are creaking here. Um, very difficult to fight against that bishop on d5. Well, by the way, who gave white such an uncontested bishop? Well, it was black himself, much earlier when he decided to trade his bishop for the knight on f3. So that um, this position is really the product of that decision, it's quite a logical product. And if black castles, then we've got this move. And you see the difference here is that this knight is unprotected because the a7 pawn is no longer there. So we're threatening to win the knight. And of course, we're threatening a discovery. And if knight takes, bishop takes, then the exact same problem happens. This pawn falls and the, there are problems on that diagonal. You can take on a8. You can also first take here. So what did we kind of learn from this example? Um, you know, this whole line that I just showed you was really just the product of logic. Um, when I was trying to figure out the right approach, you know, afterwards I checked it with the computer and the computer just kind of um, agreed that this was a very uh, logical way for the game to proceed, you know, with um, when white castles and black tries to develop, white puts its pieces into the game, tries to stop him from developing the way he wants. So even though it was a, like a long line, 
um, it's it's a line that follows a pretty logical um, a pretty logical path that you can sort of deduce when you play your own game and that um, and pretty much just get this position just by thinking you know sort of along those lines you know how do you take advantage of your opponent's lack of development well you, first of all you got to develop yourself and that's why and this is something that's very hard for people that I found people um to to just understand is that when they lose material they're often thinking how to get it back right away right something very concrete and um, not realizing that sometimes you got to take a more long-term approach you got to give um, White's position a chance to show its strength here without going for immediate gains right away. It just made me um, think of how you can compare that to you know like a like a stock, right? You don't want to necessarily sell sell your stock. You might want to wait a little bit until it um, is worth more and then sell it. So same thing for White. You know he's not interested in regaining a pawn right away. He'd like the value of posi his position to go up first before he starts reaping material gains. Um, so I really like this approach. I feel like it's very organic to this position, the move castles, um, taking the open file, activating the rook, developing the bishop, making threats. Um, and, and then I really like these little moves that um, prevent black from carrying out what he wants to do, like a move like a4, right? All of those moves, um, how do you think of them, guys? Well, um, by always being very focused on what your opponent wants, right? And really balancing like your own ideas with those of your opponent. That's really the key. Like if you're not thinking about that here, you know, you might make a move like, I don't know, knight d5 right away. You might play, I don't know, queen b3, not noticing your, you know, what your opponent, what his pieces are doing, like attacking the d4 pawn, right? Um, I mean, I've just had, I, I'm letting you know this because I've had students that this, uh, this pawn has disappeared magically from the board. Um, but if you're very aware of what your opponent wants, then, and you understand what an important strategy it is to prevent your opponent's ideas, and we, we haven't talked about that yet, but we eventually will, will um, in the section on harmony, then a move like a4 is going to, um, come to your mind, you know, when you will see the problems that you're, you gotta solve, and how to do that. Well, the a4 pawn helps you a lot. All right, and you see, like these, this part of the game is really about forcing Black to weaken himself, actually, against his own will. The move f6 provoking that, then provoking the move a a5, right? So Black is kind of helping you out here, and then we eventually get to this position where White starts to um, reap reap the reap the fruits of his of uh, his developments and his better pieces. So, um, that was kind of just an interesting example for me to see how, you know, my students even knowing um, what we'd seen in the first example still thought that this could work, right? Because it was a little bit different, but, and, it, and it is different in an interesting way. And, and it is definitely kind of harder for white to figure out what to do here, to figure out the right approach. But the lesson really is, guys, that um, you got to rely on, on your pieces, on your superior development, even in the long run. So sometimes you're just not going to be able to win in two moves, and you can't win back material as you would like in two moves. right? So you got to rely that in the long run, putting your pieces on the best squares that you're able to do and your opponent is not. Because that's, that's kind of the difference here. White's not completely developed here either, as you see. The difference, though, is that white can develop. Black is not stopping him. But when black tries to do the same thing, white's able to stop him. Um, and that's the big difference between the two sides in this position. And you just got to rely on that and trust that that kind of play, you know, um, completing developments and putting your pieces on the right squares, that that is going to be the correct strategy that's going to bring you the results you want. All right. So these were a couple of examples from the games of my students. And now we are going to take a look at 
uh, a more famous player, Mihail Tal, um, it's a short game, and it is in a, I saw it in a collection of his games, I think he was studied chess with Tal, so we're going to take a look, e4, g6, d4, bishop, g7, knight, c3, d6, knight, f3, c6, bishop, g5, and queen, b6. All right. So that's a move I think that a lot of players will face at some points in their life. Um, you know, this kind of attack on the b2 pawn. How to deal with that? Should you play b3? Should you play rook b1? Well, definitely not queen c1, because I think that will lose you the d4 pawn. Um, how would you react to this attack? Okay, well... I asked, you know, I asked my coach this question, and, and the reason I asked him is because the computer gives um, different possibilities here for white, and not necessarily what Tal played. So I asked him, um, what's the best move, rook b1 or queen d2? And he said, well, for Tal, queen d2. <laughs> and I thought this was just a very funny, uh, very funny answer. Of course, uh, Tal was not, not, not the kind of player to play rook b1, even though the move rook b1, it's um, one of the top choices of the computer. You know, he just sees no problem with defending that pawn temporarily with the rook, and he still got the space advantage and then continuing with development. But another strategy, by the way, that the computer um, recommended that I think it's definitely not as good as what Tal did, a lot less intuitive, is the move bishop c4. But of course, the fact that the computer is suggesting this sort of move, um, just sacrificing the b2 pawn, you know, validates the whole strategy um, that Tal used, right? Which is that development uh, supersedes material. Queen takes b2. And the thing with this move is that unfortunately, because you can't play queen d2 now, you actually have to retreat your bishop. I think that's why this is a lot less um, intuitive, like you just put the bishop on g5, now you got to bring it back. Um, of course, then you continue your development. And here, black has some issues with how to develop every time he tries to play knight f6. Um, there's the move e5. Right, so I mean, white has got to do something aggressive here, otherwise black is just going to complete development and be up a pawn. So e5... And here is, I think, a pretty um, good strategy to keep in mind, right, is that when you want to neutralize your opponent's initiative, especially if you're up material, and that's why he has the initiative, you want to not be very uh, greedy about it and just give it back. So make the nice move with the knight into the center and offer back the pawn. And then, of course, you get a chance to develop, complete your development by castling. I think this position is, you know, white has still a lead in development and, um, you know, some slight initiative, but black's position is more solid. His pawn structure is more solid. White's got the separated pawns, a2, c2. So I think black should be able to neutralize this, especially since he's actually castled. Um, so, yeah, I found this whole move uh, bishop c4 right here, a less convincing pawn sacrifice, you know, having to retreat this bishop back. And by the way, just an interesting line, um, bishop takes d4. Allows white to play knight a4. And it seems to win a piece for white. Of course, it's not the end of the story because then black has this fork, and white gets the two pawns back, so now the material is even, and apparently white still has a good initiative here. It's a little bit, I mean, white, black really has no developments at all, so it's not completely shocking, but white's uh, pawn structure could be better, so it's a little surprising that it's that strong for white, this position, but Again, white stops black from castling. Has a nice little move like that, a little maneuver of the bishop to d4. And um, yeah, you can see white's position. A lot more harmonious. Black has issues with his king. 
Um, at some points, white might make the move c5 as long as he defends his knight on b5. Breaking through, opening up the position, queen e2 and c5, I would think about as a plan. Um, but okay, let's go back and see the move that Tal made much more human-like um, and thematic for us. So it's the move queen d2. Not bothering to defend the b2 pawn. Well, if they don't take it, then the move queen b6 isn't exactly very logical. And also white can castle queenside. So taking this pawn is pretty much black is obliged to do that. Well, now we get to play rook b1. So we also get to put our rook on an open file, semi-open file with a tempo, queen a3, and bishop c4. So, you know, what did white sacrifice a pawn for? Well, for a very big lead in development. I mean, white has six pieces out here. Did I count that right? I think so. Yes, six pieces, and black's got two, the bishop and the queen. So in this position, um, black decided to retreat their queen. Of course, it cannot feel very safe on a3, always subject to attack with rook b3. I tried looking at a couple of other moves here, like, for example, knight d7. Well, white has to. Again, it's a long, kind of a long-term uh, sacrifice, right? Um, that pawn castles. Knight b6. Just bishop b3. Um, and there are some issues, like, for example, I was trying to see, maybe we can play a5 and a4. Well, okay, that weakens, um, what is that weaken? Not the knight, in fact. I think we're, we're going for the move rook um, b3, trapping the queen. We might even be able to take the knight first and then come back for the queen. So, knight f6 was another move that um, I took a look at here. Rook b3, queen a5, and e5. Of course, playing forcefully. Knight d5. Takes, takes, then castle. The problem for black is that he just cannot get his king out of the center due to tactical problems with the move knight takes d5. That wins a piece like that because of this intermediate move. So we can see that the move e5, it's a key attacking move for white. One of the difficulties, I mean, I would say the main one, is that it's difficult, you know, for black to just develop the way he wants with the move knight f6, is because every time he does that, he runs into e5, and the position is opening up, and of course white is more ready for that. So black try, tries to just bring his queen back to safety for now. And what does white do? Well, we can see the missing uh, piece here, of course, is that white's not castled. So white castles. And again, knight f6 runs into the move e5. Now when you try to go into the center, actually there's a nice move here for white, not even taking with the knight, which is possible, but taking with the bishop, and then just winning the d5 pawn. And that's a very important pawn because it gives the knight an amazing position on d5, threatening the fork on c7. That's why the rook cannot be taken. And you see, I mean, just um, what, what, what we got from sacrificing that pawn was the b-file as well. So we got time, we got an open file, we got good um, potential for our pieces. And here in this line, we are using uh, the b-file. So black played e6. Well, what's the idea of that move? I guess to play the move knight e7 um, and eventually try to castle. And white brings more pieces into the game, putting them on the right squares, lining up the rook with the king, and making sure that black cannot even dream about moves like, you know, d5, of course, because there's um, going to be a pin 
on the e pawn. By the way, on the move b5, there is the move knight takes b5. Queen takes d2, knight takes d6, king d7, bishop takes. It's kind of amazing, I would say, we're in the end game and your white is losing a piece, but um, absolutely winning, bishop f4, and the knight on b8 is hanging and black tries to block, you just take and you win anyway. So, I mean, compare the mobilization of the two sides here. White every single piece in the game, all in good squares, and Black's most of his army is just um, still in the barracks. So, so Black cannot, you know, start lashing out with moves like b5 because the tactics just happen to favor White. So that was the move Knight takes b5 that we saw, and uh, temporary peace sacrifice by White. So what did Black play? Well, he played a6, and What's the idea of that move? Maybe he's, oh, I guess, trying to play the move b5, overprotecting that square. It happens to weaken this square, and white can take advantage of it in a really unexpected way with the move e5. So we've seen this move a lot. Of course, white has to open the position somewhere, so he should be looking at moves like that. Um, but in this case, it looks like, isn't black just going to keep the position closed? Well, take a look at this amazing move. Knight e4, heading for the d6 square. But doesn't that lose a piece? Queen takes, knight escapes with a check. King goes to protect the bishop. And now, just capture back. So, in this position, of course, white's pieces are wonderful except his bishop on c4 is hanging, but he can actually just lose it and be winning because uh, this square has been weakened to such an extent, there's no way to prevent knight b6, also knight f7 is hanging. And again, you can see 100% mobilization in white's army and not the same for black. So that would have been a pretty cool move. Um, Tal played something else. He played the move bishop f4, attacking that pawn and trying to provoke it to move. So mm, the queen really should have moved somewhere to d8. I mean, it was time to just take the queen back to safety, um, after which white actually should try to open up the game with this move d5. They're finally ready for it with you know all of their pieces in play. Um, and for example, if black plays this move, we take, They've got to take back because we're threatening on b7. Um, let's see, knight takes. So, of course, white keeps making moves with threats. Forces the knight to quite a bad square on the side of the board. That moves their bishop back. And even though black gets to develop here, I mean, that's already a pretty good thing. Um, They've got a lot of problems with their position. Um, the knight on h6 isn't very good. And the computer actually liked the move h3 here. Look at that, taking time out just to prevent that knight from getting into the game via g4. I see he's already, um, he's starting to think about what black wants to do and taking the time to stop it because um, nothing too effective that white can do here for the moment. So what's going on in this position. Well, white wants to play knight d5, knight c7. Um, black has uh, issues with a knight on h6, the bishop on g7, the bishop on c8. So white has a very nice um, compensation here. And let's see, if they take first on d5, you can take, and on e5, play this nice move, knight e4, setting up a sacrifice on d6. Like, for example, if they go knight e7, very logical move. There's already this kind of move, and knight takes. 
and knight c6, um, winning the knight on e7. So that's how the game really should have went. I mean, black should have played this move queen d8 here, or queen c7. But queen c7, I have a feeling Tal was ready to play this move and use the position of the queen opposite the bishop with this kind of sacrifice, very tall-like, opening up lines, and simply getting to the black king. Of course, when you see a king like that, uh, you're not in a big hurry to mate him. You know, he's, he's going to be a target for a while. Let's see what happens if the king goes to f8. Well, let's take a look at checks. Um, and I just saw one, queen b4, very difficult check to uh, defend against. So that looks like it's going to be mate. And if king goes to f6, you can play queen e3, threaten queen e5 mate. And here, you can even just take this bishop, take all the black's pieces. So here we are in this position. And instead of moving the queen back to defend the d6 pawn, black tried to play e5. Uh, seems reasonable, defending the pawn with a tempo, but unfortunately, with that little development, opening up the game was a bad idea. So Tal took, took, and of course did not even probably think about moving his bishop. He found a way into Black's position immediately. Beautiful centralizing move, queen d6, attacking the e5 pawn. And a very nice move here that if the bishop is taken, you can actually pause yourself and think about um, think about what White was planning here. A really nice move. To be honest, I didn't see it when I was um, kind of trying to figure out this game. I was thinking about the move e5 here. I thought about e5 and e6 and e5 and knight e4 to f6. And that's not bad as a, you know, much worse second option. Um, but white has the beautiful winning move, knight d5. Threatening knight c7, mate. And, you know, I like just the way this move utilizes the rook on e1. That, you know, Tal put it there for a reason, right? And here you can see that it, um, it was not just some random abstract move, that when you put your pieces on the right squares, um, eventually they're going to, that's going to pay off. So here, the opening of the e-file is deadly for black, of course. All white's pieces are unleashed on him. And that's the reason that um, after queen d6, the bishop cannot be taken. So Tringov took the knight. And white threatened checkmate. Black blocked it. And the final um, blow to Black's position. Of course, we should always be checking all the checks, captures, and threats, especially in sharp positions like this. Um, check, king takes, knight comes in, king goes here, another check, and Black resigned in this position. Well, they can't go to f8 because of queen f7. And on d8, Knight f7, king c7, and queen d6. So, yeah, like a miniature game. It was only 16 moves long. Um, but for us, I think it's very instructive just to see how, you know, starting from the opening, right, um, really the right strategy, you know, the opening is for peace development, right? That's the thing to remember. It's not, you know, no one ever said the goal of the opening is to win a pawn. Right, or to win a, a pawn at the at the um, expense of your development, and that's what we saw in this game. And the, um, and Tal showed why that's not a correct strategy. So um, I would just encourage you guys to to uh, if you at least the opening part through this prism, you know, um, is your opponent wasting too much time? You know. Um, 
are the advantages that you're going to accumulate in time and development, are they going to be worth the small amount of material that you may be giving up? And, um, and if they are, you shouldn't be afraid to sacrifice it and let your opponent spend, spend his moves taking that material while you mobilize your pieces.